He's in um, Colorado right now with no cell phone service. He's in the wilderness. Yeah, good for him. Not good for me. I would not like that. <laughs> so he is elk hunting with another pastor and um, their twin boys. So he was very excited. He texted me till he couldn't have service anymore. So he'll be back later this week. But this morning you get me. <laughs> so um, as you know, we're in the series Core Values Everyone look to your left toward the back. We have them on the back wall. So you can check them out there. You can also check them out on our website. And core values are simply, this isn't just something that Pastor Nate and I made up and, and we just thought, you know, these would, these would be really good things for, for us to abide by. All of the core values that we have are from the Word of God. And it's not just something that we as a church should do. This is something that we as believers, born-again Christians, this is the way we should conduct our lives. And so um, I know Landon taught on Weekend Club two weeks ago, and Ben taught on Eternity last week, which was awesome. And this morning I'm going to talk on We Are the Church, because this is something I'm very passionate about. Um, so before we get started this morning, let's just take a moment and pray. Father, we worship you. We thank you that we get to gather together as a group of believers, that you didn't just call us out on our own, but you called us together. You called us into your plan and into your purpose. And I thank you this morning that the word is made alive to us, that our hearts are open and ready to receive what you have, that we won't just be hearers, but we'll be doers of your word. And I thank you for the, on the inside of the hearts of this people this morning, that it stirred up what we're here for, what our purpose is, that you've called us for such a time as this, just a rekindling, Lord, of the plan and purpose of God for which you've called us, individually and corporately. And we thank you for it, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to talk about we are the church, and I'm going to read this uh, core value here. It's called we are the church. The church is not a pastor. It's a body. Let's say that. The church is not a pastor. It's a body. And guess what? You're a part of the body. Okay? So you're a part of the church. We know we're equipped to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We use the gifts he's given us to build up his body. As we do, it helps us and others grow and creates a church family that is healthy, alive, and full of love. That last line is one of my favorite things because you know what? How many of you like your own personal family? Not, the, not just the church family, but your own personal family. You like it when everyone's healthy, right? You like it when you and your spouse and your loved ones and your children are healthy. Well, you know what? The same is true in a church body. Whether you know it or not, you like it when a church body is healthy. You don't like coming in, you know, you don't like coming in seeing people sick and down and under just as much as you don't like seeing your kids sick and down and under. And you know what? We like it to be alive. Who wants to come into something that's dead? Right? I guarantee you yesterday at the TCU Arkansas game, it was very alive. And you know what? People thrive off of that. This church is alive. Why? Because God's alive. He's alive. He's alive on the inside of you. He has a plan and purpose for you. That plan and purpose is made alive and made more clear every day. And then the last one is full of love. You love when your family is full of love. Right? Who likes it? Raise your hand. If you like it when you and your spouse or you and your children or maybe aunts and uncles or grandmas or whatever, you're all fighting and bickering and at each other. Raise your hand if you like that. I don't see any hands. Raise your hand if you like when your family is strife-free, full of love, believes the best about one another, is full of joy. Right? We all like that. And you know why? Because that's the way God designed it to be. It's a spiritual thing, and we're spirit beings. We weren't designed. Our bodies weren't created to be full of strife, to be full of unforgiveness, to be full of bitterness, to be unhappy or down and under or depressed. Why? That's not our nature. That's not what we were created to be. Amen? We were created to love and to be loved. Amen? Amen? Okay, so 
What is the church? If we were to define the church, this is what you could define it as. A group of people called together. Called together. Not separately, not apart from one another. Say, I'm called together. It's an assembling or a gathering. It's a calling together. Did you know God has called you to be with people Your plan and your destiny is fulfilled by being with other people, by being called to a specific body. And I've talked about this plenty of times, but people who are just left to themselves get weird. (laughs) Who's seen the movie Castaway? We all feel bad for him, but he gets a little weird, right? By the time the movie's like three quarters of the way through, you're really thinking this Wilson volleyball is like a real person. Why did he create Wilson to be a real person in his mind? Because he needed the fellowship. He needed the fellowship. He needed someone to communicate with. He needed the relationship. God has designed us to be this way, that we are to be in relationship with one another. This is why. Why? The enemy comes to try to bring destruction to churches. And you know where it starts? Relationships. You want to know why he wants to do that? Because he wants to pull you out of the very relationships that are meant to bring strength to you, that are meant to bring the words in season to you. And you know, if you're full of offense or you're full of strife, those relationships don't work right. You're not benefiting, and those people aren't benefiting. Not to mention, if you're full of strife and offense, you're probably really not benefiting anyone else because stuff's coming out of your mouth, actions are happening that shouldn't be happening. Right? We weren't meant to function this way. Say, God's called me together. So, you know what? When the enemy comes to say things like this, you just don't belong. You just don't know where you belong. You, you just don't really have a place. You know, everyone else, you see so-and-so and your friend over here and over here, they, they really belong. But, you know, you're just a little bit different. You don't quite belong. Or, or no one's noticed you lately. You know, isn't that sad? You know, you see other people and they, they get noticed and people say hi to them and they're involved at church and they go to this group and I just, I can't really get involved. And you know what we just think? These are just thoughts that we're thinking it's not just thoughts that you're thinking. That's right. That's right. It's thoughts that the enemy's placing there to get you pulled out of the very destiny and plan that God has for you. Right. And you know what it's trying to do? It's trying to isolate you. He's trying to isolate you. You want to know why? Because he knows that there's power when we work together. He knows that the church can do powerful things when we work together. You know, you see teams of people. Yesterday, I just think of Arkansas, because we're big like football fans and all that, sports fans. And you know, Allen could have got out there by himself, and Arkansas would have lost the game. You wanna know why? He can't do all of the work. He can't run all the plays. He can't make all the touchdowns. He can't kick the ball. He can't, he can't do it all. But you know what? Allen, with the team around him, can win championships. I'm speaking into existence, Landon. You saw it yesterday. What happened? The team rallied together. And you know what? The running back wasn't going to Allen. Oh, you know what? He just always throws the ball. He just gets up there and throws the ball and tells us what to do. Why can't I just do what he's doing? And you didn't see the defensive guys going, man, you know, all the offensive guys, they get all the attention because they make all the cool catches and they get to do this and they get to run the plays and all we do is just defend the ball. No, you know what? Each one owned their position. And you know what? Each one of you in here, you have to own your position. And it's not out of a prideful thing. It's out of saying, you know what? God's called me to do great things. And some of you just need to hear that this morning. God's called you to do great things. 
And you know what? He's not looking at your past. You're, you may be looking at your past. He doesn't see your past. You want to know why? Because that's under the blood of Jesus. So if he's wiped it away and he's forgotten about it, why are you thinking about it? Put it behind you. And what did Paul say? I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. He was pressing toward. You know, you can't press toward something when you're looking back behind you. But you can press toward when you know your future is bright. God has great plans for you. And you know what? The enemy knows how great it is, which is why he's trying to do everything he can to pull you out. But you know what? We are not ignorant. What does the word say? Of his devices. That means what? We can recognize and we can say, oh, no, devil. Nope, I recognize that. I'm not going down that path. So when he comes to bring thoughts of your past, nope, that's under the blood of Jesus. That's gone. When he tries to say you don't belong or you don't fit, nope, I'm a called and chosen instrument of the Lord. You have to answer that back. Know who he's called you to be. Okay. Um, let's look here at um, Ephesians. Um, you can turn to Ephesians 4. And did you know the person to the right and to the left of you, if you've received Jesus... You're called to work with that person. You know, it's not by chance that you're in this body or in this place today. It's not by chance that you come to be on church and this is part of your family, or maybe if you don't yet, you know, see that if this is a place that God has you, but if not, you find your place. Because you cannot fulfill your destiny apart from the local church. I'll say it again. You cannot fulfill your destiny your plan or purpose without the local church. So if beyond church is not your place, that's great. But find the place that he's called you to be and get in and stay there and be faithful. Why? Because you'll abound with blessing. You'll be fruitful. You'll be a blessing to other people. You can use the gifts. You know, if God's given us gifts, they have to be used somewhere. Well, where are they to be used? In the local church. You know, if, if Pastor Nate were up here and he's trying to preach the message, but then someone calls and says, oh, man, there's screaming babies back in the back. And, oh, so-and-so, you know, is having some issue out in the parking lot. And he's running around trying, oh, and you know what? We need to take up the offering. So he's going down and taking up. No. Why does God call us to a body? Because each one brings their supply to ultimately what? Build the kingdom of God. Not build a church. We're not here to build beyond church. Just like Southside Baptist isn't down there trying to build Southside Baptist. What are we trying to do? We are building his church. The body of Christ. You're not just a part of beyond church. You're a part of the body of Christ. And so it's vital that we know this. And to know, you know what, the church isn't just something that we come in on Sunday morning and we check our religious box and, yep, I went to church and I did kind of my religious duty and now I can go throughout my week and then I'll come again on Sunday and do it again and that was a good message and it, it has helped me. No, that's not what the church is. The church isn't a building. You know, you hear people sometimes say, well, the church will do it. Well, who's the church? Take your finger, put it out, and do this. I'm the church. Say that. I'm the church. Who's the hands and feet of Jesus? I am. If we're going to get a job done, and we're going to win souls, and we're going to advance the kingdom of God, point your finger right back at yourself. And you know who you're going to do it with? Look at the people next to you. And you know what? You might as well get used to liking their face 
and liking these people because you want to know the awesome thing about the Lord? It's not just here on earth. Did you know the church isn't just a Sunday morning check the box? The church goes on into eternity. The church is an eternal thing. The body of Christ is an eternal thing. So you know what? The person next to you or the person that kind of rubs you the wrong way or the person from another church that maybe you just don't like, better get used to it because you're going to be with them forever. Right? You can't look at them in heaven and go, oh, come on. And I have a funny feeling maybe God just has a sense of humor and you'll be right next door to them. <laughs> so you might as well learn to love here, right? It is. It's an eternal thing. And we get so caught up in the natural here and now. And what, what the enemy does is he focuses it all on yourself. I don't fit. I don't belong. Or this person bugged me or this person didn't say hi to me or this person, my leader didn't appreciate me or this didn't happen or this or that or that. And what's it doing? It's pulling you out of the very place, or trying to pull you out, of the very place that God has called you. So what am I here to, today to say? The church is the greatest organization on the planet. That's right. You want to know why? Because guess who's leading it? Jesus. He's the head of the church. And we're going to see here in a minute, he's building his church. You know God's a builder? So right now where the church is at, all of the born-again people all across the world, he's not satisfied with it just staying how it is. You know what he's satisfied with? Till all hear. Till all know. So you know what? If he's not satisfied with it, we shouldn't be satisfied with it. If he's not satisfied with it just staying the same, we shouldn't be satisfied with us staying the same, nor should we be satisfied with the person next to us staying the same. So what are we to do? This is why you need to be called to a body, because you can help spur one another on. Encourage people to grow. Hey, you know what? I didn't see you on Sunday. Well, you know, I've just been having a hard time and this has been going on in my family, and this in my marriage, or whatever, then what are you there to do? You're there to help build them up and encourage them. You give them the word. So don't say you don't have a plan and you don't have a purpose, because you have empty chairs next to you, you have people next to you, we have a world to reach, we have a city to reach, we have a state to reach, and I'm not satisfied with how it is. He's not satisfied with how it is. His desire is for it to ever be growing and ever be building. Amen? So let's be a part of helping him do that. So where did I tell you? Ephesians? Okay. Ephesians 4. Uh, We'll start in verse 3. Um, It says, Be eager and strive earnestly. This is out of the Amplified to guard and keep the harmony and oneness produced by the Spirit in the binding power of peace. So what do we see here? This is one of our roles as a member of the body of Christ, to be eager to strive for harmony. And you know, he wouldn't tell us to strive for, to strive for harmony or to strive for unity, other translations say, if it wasn't going to be something that Satan tried to attack. How many of you have ever seen dysfunction in the church? Raise your hand. Strife. We all have. But what does it say we're to do? Strive for unity. Strive for oneness. So you know what? This doesn't mean that we say, well, Sarah, you know what? You just really need to work on that love walk. When it says strive for oneness, you can do this finger again. You don't do it by pointing to other people or pointing to other churches or pointing to other pastors. You strive for unity by starting with yourself. 
and you make a determination to say, I will walk in love. And why can we do this? Just like the song that we sang right at the end. Because we know how much we've been loved and because we know how much we've been forgiven, therefore we can love and therefore we can forgive. If you have the love and forgiveness down, you got it. Because you know what? In the church, I've heard people say, well, I'm just not going to be a part of a church because they just did this and I got hurt. And uh, Welcome to reality. Want to know why? Because the church is made up of people. And guess what? People aren't perfect. You aren't perfect. You mess up. So you know what? When you know how much you've been loved... And when you truly understand how much he loves you, knowing this, just like Landon said at the beginning, he died for you when you rejected him. He died for people even knowing in the future they would reject him. But you know what? That didn't change his love. So when you begin to understand that kind of love, you can love the person next to you. You can love the person that's not kind to you. You can love the leader over you. You can love the people under you. You can love the people at another church. You can love the pastors at another church. Because you know how much you've been loved. And you know what? When someone kind of rubs you the wrong way or you want to get offended or get mad, you can remember remember how much God has forgiven you. Because you know what? As much as... You think other people are just irritating you. You've probably irritated them, if not more. (laughs) And you know what? Those people have shown mercy and grace and forgiveness toward you. So the moment we want to begin to start spreading stuff over Facebook, or spreading stuff to our friends, or even, I'll go so far as to say, spreading stuff to our spouse. Spreading stuff to our mom or dad or relationships of people we think they get me, they understand, they're here to help me. This is a verse we use a lot in our household. Whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's of a good report, think on these things. Why do we think on these things? Because what we think on is what we're going to say. We need to get so to the point where we can look at anyone and we can love them. Despite their past, despite their mistake, we don't call out people's mistakes. We don't throw it all over and say, did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear what happened? What does the word say? They will know us by our love, not for the world, They'll know us by our love for one another. This is why the enemy comes in and he's working overtime to try to bring in strife to who who can I give this thought to? Who's going to take it? Who's going to bite? Who can I get mad at so-and-so? What churches can I get against each other? What pastors can I get against each other? What leaders can I get? What people inside families? Not just in between churches, in between marriages, in between spouses. I mean, it's everywhere. And what is it doing? It's trying to isolate you. It's trying to put you in bondage. Did you know that the, the word says where there's strife and discord, there's every evil work? I didn't see anyone raise their hand for liking strife. You want to know why? Because we don't like it. And, you know, you hear people say, well, I just thrive on drama, or that person just thrives on drama. No, they really don't. Deep down, you weren't created to thrive on drama. You know what it is? It's It's a hole that they're needing filled. And you know what needs to fill it? The love of God. And you know what? You can be a tool and a vessel to love someone right back into the plan of God. You know, the world, I've heard it before. I, I've actually talked to people in the world that have said, oh, I don't need that church stuff. They're just hypocrites. You've heard it. We've all heard it. They're hypocrites, this and that. You know what? 
our love for one another speaks so strongly. So what do we know? We have to guard it. And don't feel bad guarding it. You know, if so, if someone if Mona's coming up to me, as much as I love Mona, and if she's coming up to me and she just starts, whatever, I can say, hey, you know what? Let's not talk about that. Right. That's not a bad thing. Right. You are responsible for your ears. Right. You are responsible for what you say. Yep. You are responsible for the choices you make. And our society today wants to push the blame on everybody else. I'm offended because so-and-so did this. I'm hurt because so-and-so did this. I can't do this because of how I was raised. I can't do this because of how I was brought up and you don't know my past. What's it doing? Blaming. No. We're where we are today by the choices we've made. By the choices I've made. And you want to know the awesome thing about the Lord is right now today, you can make the choice to turn it around. You're tired of living in strife. You're tired of seeing the enemy destroy your family, destroy your marriage, destroy churches. You're tired of it destroying relationships and those around you and your family and your relationships being full of drama. You can turn it around today by saying, I will choose. Say that. I will choose to love. It's all a choice. Aren't you thankful that the Lord allows us to choose? As much as we think, you know, maybe we'd want him to, you know, just be robots going around. No. It's a good thing that we choose. And it's his mercy that every day we can choose. Amen? Okay, I'm way off my notes, but we'll get back. Um, let's turn uh, to Matthew 16. Are you guys thankful to be a part of the church? Matthew 16. And we'll start in verse uh, 13. And it says, now when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they answered, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, were any of those answers right? The disciples said, well, some people say you're this, some people say you're this. None of those answers were right, though, even though people were saying that. And he said unto them, and I love this, but who do you say that I am? So he threw it back at the disciples. Okay, I understand those people are saying that, but who do you say that I am? So you know what? In your church family, it's not just enough to know what the church, you know, what we believe here as a church. You know, we believe you're called to a local body. We believe in faith. We believe in healing. We believe in speaking in tongues. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We believe in all that. But you know what? You can say, well, that's the church that I go to, and yeah, they believe that, or they teach on that. But you know what you have to answer is this question. Who do you say that he is? Sometimes I think we as believers kind of try to hide under the covering of the church. You know, people may ask, well, do they believe in that healing stuff at the church you go to? Oh, yeah, you know, they kind of teach that there. No, yeah, they do, and I believe in healing. Yeah. Who, what do you believe? Who do you believe? Do you believe past circumstances? Do you believe, just like the disciples, what they said, what people were saying? Do you believe what people say about the church and God's design for the church? Or do you believe what he says about the church? This is questions we have to ask. Who do you say that I am? And that's what I heard him asking us today. Who do you say that I am? Not what Beyond Church believes. Not what Pastor Nate and Evan believe. But what do you believe? What does the word say? What does it mean to you? We have to get personal. 
So who do you say that he is? And then um, we'll keep reading here. And then Peter, I love Peter. You know, he's always piping up, right? But this time he's right. (laughs) He's finally like, yes, I finally got it right. So Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus answered him, and I can just hear him, bless you, Peter. (laughs) Finally, finally you got this right, buddy. No, he probably didn't say it like that. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and, and blood, or men, have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter. And this is in the Greek, Petros, a large piece of rock. And on this rock, or a huge rock like Gibraltar, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it, or be strong to its detriment, or hold out against it. Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth, must be what is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose or declare lawful on earth must be what is already loosed in heaven. So this is kind of the first uh, mentionings of the church. So Jesus is kind of starting to talk to, to the disciples about this. And you know when he says, you know, you hear people say, well, the church is built on Peter. That's not right. Because this says here, you are Peter, which is like a large piece of rock. But then it says, and on this rock, and in the Greek, if you study this out, it's a huge rock, meaning a foundation rock. When he referred to Peter, it's like a rock that can be moved. This second rock that he's talking about, the rock that the church is built on, is a solid foundation that cannot be moved. Solid and strong. And what is the church built on? The revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the foundation of the church. Not a person, not a pastor, the rock of Jesus Christ. Amen? Sorry, my iPad keeps uh, going to passcode. Okay, um, so we can see here, the Lord says... I will build my church. How many of you know when the Lord says he's going to do something, he does it? Is he building his church right now? All across the world, he's building his church. And what is his promise to us? I will build the church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So did you know, no matter how hard the enemy tries, he can never overcome the church? Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful that you're a part of something that Satan, as hard as he tries, can never overcome? So God already set you up in a place of victory. As a part of the local church, you're a part of something that can never fail. That's good news. So is the church something that we could say is near and dear to the Lord's heart? If he's building it, I would say it's near and dear to his heart. So if it's near and dear to his heart, should it be near and dear to our heart? So conversations like this, I just don't do church. Have you ever been to church? It's just full of a bunch of hypocrites. I gave up on the church a long time ago. Really? Because God hasn't. God hasn't given up on the church. If, if God hasn't given up on the church, why should we give up on the church? So this is an encouragement to you today. I don't care where you've been, how hurt you've been, situations that have come up. Do not give up on the church. Don't give up on it. You want to know why? The church is the hope of the world. The church is the one that will usher in Jesus Christ. The church is the one that says we'll be without spot or wrinkle and will be full of glory. Aren't you thankful that you're called as a part of the church? 
So no more do we entertain thoughts of, I'm done. I'm quitting. No, 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 no. Because we recognize where that comes from. And you know what, Lord, if you're about building the church and you said I could do this, then I can do it. And no offense, no strife, no nasty evil thoughts from you is going to pull me out. So if he's building his church, our question should be, what is my part to build the church and advance the kingdom? So if you're taking notes, you can write that down. What is my part to advance the church and to build the kingdom? Because if he's saying he's building the church and he's the head and we're the body, then therefore we're the hands and feet. We are called to do something. Say, I'm called to do something. I'm not just called to come in on Sunday morning, check my religious box, live my life, and then come back the next Sunday morning, check my box. No. My purpose in life, and I want everyone to hear this, my purpose in life is to build the kingdom of God. That's your purpose. Why do you have children? It's not just, oh, so they can be cute and I can raise cool kids. This is the world. They can be involved in sports and maybe, you know, everyone can say how cool they are and they did great. Whatever it might be. You are training your children to advance God's kingdom. If you're training them to do anything else, you're training them wrong. So parents that just say, you know, my kids go to church, but I don't go to church, wrong. Wrong training. Right. Training them to just go when it's convenient, go around the sports schedule, go when we feel like it, go when we're not tired yeah. or we're not busy. No, you're, you're training them to say, you know what, guys, we're just going to take God and the building of his kingdom and just kind of put it over here for a second, and we're just going to build this for a little bit. Your children are put in your hands to train to advance God's kingdom. Because you know what? If your children are not trained to advance God's kingdom, this next generation will be hurting. We're, we're not called as the body of Christ to kind of do this. Every generation should be advancing and increasing. Yeah. We should want our children to go further than we have. Not just in the marketplace. Spiritually speaking, go further. Take the gospel further. Reach more people. Yeah. Be more innovative and creative. Yeah. And so... This is something we have to look at every day. Every day when we wake up, how am I advancing his kingdom today? Not my kingdom, not my life, not, not my family. Because you know, when you, Matthew 6, when you put first the kingdom of God, he makes sure to add everything you need. So you put first his kingdom, he'll be sure your family's taken care of. He'll be sure your job's taken care of. He'll be sure health and healing, all of that. Provision, everything necessary to do what he's called you to do will be there. If you seek first his kingdom. So that should be the question we ask ourselves every day. We wake up. What am I doing today to advance his kingdom? And if your daily schedule looks nothing like advancing his kingdom in any way, then this is where we should take a self-check and say, okay, Lord, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? And you know, we're all at different stages of spiritual growth. So for you advancing God's kingdom, you may, you may think, I don't even know how to advance God's kingdom because I don't even feel like I know enough of the word to be able to help advance God's kingdom or share my faith or, you know, tell people about healing. I, I don't know that. We have next level. That was a plug. We have next level. You have Sunday mornings. 
You have Wednesday nights. You have devotions you can do at home. If you need stuff, I can help. Our staff, our, our leaders can help you get stuff. So there's no excuse for you not to grow. But you know what? If you're saying, you know what? What advancing God's kingdom looks like is me needing, I mean, we should all do this, but me needing to grow so I can I can share about healing to my friend who's battling something. I can know scriptures for how to lead someone to the Lord or whatever it might be. There's ways for you to do it. But you know what it takes? Self-look and saying, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do in this season right now? What does advancing your kingdom and the church look like to you? For me personally, what does it look like? You know what? It may be taking starting point. If this is where God's called you, start by taking starting point every Sunday and getting involved and getting hooked up with other believers and not just sitting, but serving and using your gifts. You know, there's people in here that God has called you to do things and to use your gift to benefit others and sitting and not using it is not benefiting others. We're called by the Lord to be a builder. So you know what? You are graced to build. Say that. I'm graced and anointed to build, to build God's kingdom. So no one in this room is lacking in grace or anointing to help build God's kingdom. You have all the grace and anointing necessary for you right now to help advance God's kingdom. You know what you just have to do? Lord, I receive it. I receive that. And then put it to use. Um, I did want to talk on this. Um, in the Greek, when it talks about in Matthew here, about the gates of hell not prevailing against the church. It literally means the gates of hell and powers of darkness shall not be able to overpower the church. Amen. Not now, not tomorrow, not ever. I'm going to take this with me. Nor will the power or gates of hell be able to tear us down. Nor can they hold out against us taking ground. The church taking nations, cities, states is fully capable. Because you want to know why? This world is full of people held in darkness, gated up, held up, blind, locked up, and those gates will not be able to hold out against the church. So the gates that the enemies put up that he thinks he has all these people in darkness, bound up, he can't win. You want to know why? Because the church is advancing. And we're advancing into his territory. Where once was dark, it can't be dark anymore. Because the church has showed up with the light. And one other thing, the devil fears the church. Far too long has the church acted like the devil's just this scary guy. And oh my gosh, don't, don't say that too loud because the devil might hear you. Cowering in a corner. No, we're a mighty army. We've been given all the tools necessary to overcome him. And he's scared of you. He's scared of the church. The devil fears the church. And you know what? He doesn't want anyone to know this. He doesn't want the church to know this. But you know what? Too late for this church. He fears us. He fears what we're doing in this city. And in this community. You want to know why? Because we're pulling people left and right out of the kingdom of darkness. The other churches in this community are pulling people left and right out of the kingdom of darkness. And we're on the same team. We are the body of Christ.
So I wrote this, the gates of hell cannot prevail. Nothing the devil can do can hold the church back. Panic overwhelms him at the thought of what the entire body of Christ can do in the earth. When he thinks about the entire body of when he thinks about what the entire body of Christ can do in the earth, he's scared spitless. You got to get that. When he thinks about what we as the body of Christ can do, he's scared. Which is why he's trying to come in with strife and division and offense because he knows if I can get them with that, they'll be powerless. You know what binds us together is the love of God. You know, even in the body, in this body, we don't all have the same opinions. I could slap up a paint color up on the wall and you know what? Half of you would like it and half of you wouldn't. Half of you would say, let's paint it this color and half of you not. We could, we could do a, an event and some of you would say, well, it would have been better this way or we should have done this or this is how it would have been more effective, yada, yada. But you know what? Forget that. That's not what it's about. We're advancing God's kingdom. So you know what we do? We get behind each other and we say, you know what, enough of my petty differences, enough of me getting hurt or offended or not liking this or not liking how they said that or not liking what they do or not liking how Pastor Nate did this or whatever. But saying, you know what, I'm a part of this church. And more importantly, I'm a part of the body of Christ. You know what, you, can take, church, you could take other word of faith churches and we wouldn't all agree on everything. And you know what? Southside Baptist down the road, we don't agree with everything. Grace Church, we don't agree with everything. Whatever other churches are around, we don't agree with everything. But you know what we do agree on? Jesus is the head of the church. We're his body. We're here to advance the kingdom. We're here to take back territory that the devil's taken and win souls for the Lord. So let's agree on what we agree on and forget the petty junk. Because you know what? They know us. They're drawn to him by the love we have for one another. And not just love for one another inside this body, which yes. And this is something Pastor Nate and I are strong on, probably me a little, a little more than him. Because I've seen what strife does. And I, we don't allow it in this church. You want to know why? Every evil work. Every evil work. So you can pretty much trace back anything evil anything going wrong, and you can trace it back to strife. And you know what? This church is to be healthy and thriving and full of love. So you know what? We believe the best about one another. We encourage one another. We don't fault find. We don't talk bad about people. We believe the best. Other churches in our community, we believe the best. We say only good things. We build up the body. You're called to build it up, not tear it, tear it down. You're not called to come into this body and tear it down. And it, it, frankly, it's not allowed here. Love is what abounds here. That's what we say all the time. Love abounds here. And you know what? Love for the other churches is what abounds here. Love for our community is what abounds here. Love for the church as a whole is what abounds. So you know what? You hear people talking bad about other ministers. I see it all over Facebook, and it irritates me to no end. So-and-so ministers saying this, this and that. This, they're a part of the body of Christ. You know what? If their message is winning people to Jesus, who cares? If it's building up other people, who cares? It's advancing his kingdom. Let's be about purpose, not all the petty ways of how we get there. Let's be about, let's be for people. You know, Jesus is for people. Jesus is for you. Jesus is for your family. Jesus is for your church. Jesus is for your marriage. If he's for you and he's for others, then we should be for others. And may we guard our mouths where, where what comes out is love. Not, not pointing out fingers. 
Because you know what? That's just a tool of the enemy for him to get in. And you know what? All it takes, it, it can just take one. Just one starting to do this. So you know what? If you see one or hear one just doing this, lovingly you can say, stop. I'm not doing that. This is my church. This is the body of Christ. And I am building it. I'm not tearing it down. So let's stand this morning. You know, God is for you. God is for you. And you know, that's why he brings messages like this to us. Because he's for you. Because you know what? When he sees areas that, that need adjustment in our lives, and you know, this one is for every person. I'm not up here saying I've never said anything bad about someone or I've never done anything wrong. Everyone in this room has not walked in love or said something they shouldn't have. But you know what? This is why he brings these messages to us so that we can look and not just say, oh, that was good. But we can look and say, Lord, what do I need to change? What do I need to do? What steps do I need to take to grow spiritually? I did want to read this. This, um, Oh, geez. This should have. Now I know why he gets so upset with his iPad sometimes. Okay. Your role as a believer and a part of the body of Christ. So, raise your hand if you're a believer. Okay, that makes you a part of the body of Christ. Okay? Your role is number one to grow spiritually. So you take every way possible for you to grow. If that means getting out your word in the morning or in the evening, whenever works best for you, putting on teaching, faith teaching, word teaching, not, not this teaching that says God put sickness on you or whatever. What the word says, teaching, that will actually help you grow. <laughs> okay? So you take every opportunity and measure you have to grow spiritually. Number two, you build the church. And I'm not just talking about this church. I'm talking about the whole body of Christ church. You build it. So your actions, your words, should be toward building up the church. Number three, to remain in love. Which means what? You refuse to get into strife and you refuse to get into offense. And you choose to believe the best about others. How can you remain in love? Because you know how much you've been loved. So what do we see our roles are? Grow spiritually, build the church, remain in love. You do those three things, you're advancing his kingdom. Amen. Let's close our eyes and just bow our heads. Father, we just worship you this morning. We thank you that you brought this word to us as a body. So we take it. And we say we won't just be hearers, but we'll be doers of your word. Lord, we say we make a fresh commitment to you today. And if that's you, you just need to make a fresh commitment to the Lord. You need to make a fresh commitment to advancing his kingdom and a fresh commitment to say my words and my actions will build the church and not tear it down. If that's you, just raise your hand. This is just a commitment between you and the Lord. And you say, I'm stepping out and I'm saying, Lord, I'm building your kingdom. I'm taking those steps to build your kingdom. So Lord, we do, we lift our hands and we say, we're about your kingdom. We're about your way. Not our way, but your way. Your will be done. And we know, Lord, that together this body, unified, 
is going to do great things to advance your kingdom where you've set us here in Alma, Arkansas, in this city and in this community and state. We thank you, Lord, and we say yes to the plan of God. Yes to working with those to the right and to the left of us. Yes to loving and believing the best and calling out the gifts in other people. Bringing them up to a higher level, building them up. We say yes to it because we know it's significant to the plan of God. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know you're significant to the plan of God? That was really weak. I just got through a whole message, (laughs) y'all. You're significant to the plan of God. Don't let the enemy tell you otherwise. You're significant and you make a big part and a big impact. Amen.